Let's read from Daniel chapter 2. Now, it's a long, long chapter, um, as these chapters tend to be, 49 verses. But it's important that we read all of it so that we understand exactly uh, the story. So, Daniel uh, chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This is the Word of God. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you're trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No, king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Antioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. 
As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than any other living man, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The winds swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was a dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the, same, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and um, ordered that an offering and, and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. I mean, what a glorious story. And uh, we trust the preaching will help us understand what it all means. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you for this powerful word that you've given to us. And we are mindful that you are the God who rules forever and ever. Wisdom and power are yours. You control time and you control the seasons. You set up kings and governments and empires and you bring them back down again. You give wisdom to your people and discernment to your church. You 
reveal deep and significant things as you know truth and as you are light. It is so good that creatures like us can know you and be known by you. And as we live in our Babylon, we can see all around us seduction to sin. It's so evident. As we live in our Babylon, falsehood is commonplace. As we live in our Babylon, misery and depression and emptiness is the daily diet of so many people. But you give life, real life. You provide truth, absolute truth. You bring peace and grace into the lives of people like us. And so we know tonight, we know 100% of the time, the answer to our needs is in you. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, you are the sacrifice for our sins. Jesus, you are the hope of the nations. Jesus, you are the king of the church. Jesus, you are the rock cut out of the mountain, not by hand or human hand, but by the power of God. You, Lord Jesus, your kingdom, your body will grow and grow and grow and will last for eternity while all these empires and all these governments and kings and princes will disappear. They will come and they will go, but you, you reign forever. And because of that, we are excited. And we're thankful that this evening hour, we're aware that we could be a hundred other places, but here we are before your word in your presence with ears that are open, wanting to hear from the rock. So our Father, lead us to the rock and keep us in the rock and bless us as your people. We bring our prayers in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles um, open at Daniel 2, we'll just go straight into our sermon. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army besieges Jerusalem and takes into exile selected potential leaders among God's people. And as we thought about last week, the idea, the aim was to brainwash them, to indoctrinate these young men and utterly, permanently change them from being godly people into godless rulers. And we thought last week about them tearing them away from the worship of the living God and transferring them into the Babylonian mindset. And they used all kinds of methods. We thought about isolation, indoctrination, indulgence, identity change, every trick in the trade they used. But God is in control, even in this exile situation. And for Daniel and his friends, and remember when they started this process, they were probably no older than 14 as they went through that university uh, education of three years, finishing it obviously at 17. They knew that God was sovereign and God was in control and God was helping them. And this is equally true of us, of course, because we live as God's elect, as strangers in this world, scattered in this place aliens and exiles here for a very short period of time compared to eternity. And our Babylon, in a sense, wants to deceive us, to enslave us, and ultimately to destroy us. I want you to keep remembering that because, well, when I'm certainly preaching, I will be saying this over and over and over again. Our Babylon, our world, it's not neutral. It wants to deceive us, 
enslave us and destroy us, and it's having a field day in this generation. And I'm glad we have so many uh, 14 to 17-year-olds here tonight, because you are target number one. Don't forget it. But God actually wants to use us in our Babylon to be a prayerful, pure proclaimers of his message. So we are in exile, yes. We are in our Babylon, and we're here to please our God. You may remember I I, I quoted, if you please God, it doesn't really matter who you don't please. But if you don't please God, it doesn't really matter who you do please. So chapter 1, God is in control even in exile. Chapter 2 is basically about this, that we need wisdom, and actually God gives us wisdom to live as exiles in our Babylon. So we're going to uh, think about the need for wisdom, the wrong answer, the right answer, and the effects of the, uh, of, of what happens uh, in this declaration of the wisdom of God. So if, let's first of all think about the need in verses 1 to 3. Now, I'm sure you've worked out that Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man in the whole world at this particular time. A mighty military campaign had led to this particular situation. Politically and military, he was untouchable. His word was unquestionable. And his decisions were undeniable. Humanly speaking, he was a picture of power, of might, and of control. Everything was stable and secure under his leadership. But one night, Nebuchadnezzar was destabilized by a divinely appointed nightmare. I don't know if you get nightmares or even bad dreams. If you do, then you'll know exactly how he might have been feeling that next morning. It was dark and it was unsettling. The word troubled or troubling is used twice in these first three verses. The Babylonians, you see, believed that dreams were the means by which their God spoke to their king. And then the king would pass on the message to the people. The king, therefore, was like a conduit to and from the divine. So everything went through the king, upwards and downwards. But of course, the issue about this particular dream was interpretation, verse 3, or verse 2. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to help him or tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in, they stood before him, and he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. You see, the need for this particular king, King Nebuchadnezzar, was... Wisdom. He needed wisdom to understand what had happened. We also need wisdom, don't we? Every single day, all the time. There are many issues that we face, young and old alike. They're different in some ways, but similar in the sense that we all need this wisdom to survive and to thrive in our Babylon. It could be issues about family, or finances, or jobs, or relationships, or study, or plans after study, or where we're going to work. And there could be ethical choices, for instance. Sometimes there are complex problems. Aging parents. Helping people through the valley of the shadow of death. Burdens and pressures. Very often, there's no easy or straightforward answer. And sometimes they cause us sleeplessness, don't they? We, we, we have troubled minds. And we know, don't we? Or we should. That we need wisdom. Well, so did Nebuchadnezzar. He's just an ordinary man, you see. But the problem was, he was looking for the wrong answer. Nebuchadnezzar is a classic example of our modern world. Ancient Babylon... It actually is so like our modern Babylon. That old Babylon is just like the Babylon we live in, our world. Never have we had so much power, so much wealth, and so much knowledge. Never in the history of humanity have we been in the position we're in right now. And yet never 
Never have we had so many depressed, insecure, fearful, paranoid people. Misery is all around us. Emptiness and brokenness that seems it can only be satisfied either with a bottle in one hand or a shopping trip in the other. And a mixture of all kinds of things. A cocktail of easy fixes. Despite all our gadgets and all our toys, our tranquilizers and pills, we feel so out of control, don't we? We're out of control. We are a troubled world. Babylon. Some have described this as the cardiac age, the age of the troubled heart. Pools are carried out all the time in our Babylon. There was a recent one. And do you know what they said? Over 50% of people who were polled admitted they were unhappy, verging on being depressed. Over 50%. Eight out of ten in that poll believed that it would require a major lifestyle change to bring about peace of mind and happiness. The NHS tells us they are expecting a tsunami of mental health issues after what's happened in this last year. Among the issues that they will have to address is the the aftermath of, of isolation and loneliness, unmet expectations, bored minds and lots of fear and insecurity, the demand for chemicals just to get through the day and the night will be immense. Now, I know I'm no expert in these things. I'm not even pretending to be. And I know many have genuine medical issues that require genuine medical answers. But, leaving aside that, there is little doubt that when a generation says, bye-bye, God, we don't need you anymore. Bye-bye, God, we don't need your wisdom anymore. When a, a society or a generation says that, then there will be consequences. And we are reaping today what we have sown for decades. Bye-bye, God. Bye-bye, God. In Babylon, you see, we all need wisdom. The problem is most people look in the wrong places. And Nebuchadnezzar, he looks to what? To whom? Magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers. You see, of course, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar could buy any kind of experts he wanted. He had all the power and all the influence and all the money to do that. And for Nebuchadnezzar, of course, he got in um, the, the dream counselors. Yeah, there actually was a, a group of people who studied dreamology. We referred to that earlier on. They also had, not just in Babylon, but in major cities right across the ancient world, libraries filled with um, scrolls about dreams. Do you ever see in the movies, you know, these uh, law or legal libraries uh, filled with um, books with legal cases and, and decisions? Well, they had dream libraries filled with scrolls containing all kinds of information and interpretation about dreams. And these Libraries were visited by magicians, enchanters, and sorcerers, and astrologers. And they, in a sense, were the Ghostbusters, 600 BC style. Normally, of course, Nebuchadnezzar slept quite well. So this was a cozy job. Maybe one day a week. You know, if somebody offers you good money for working one day a week, wouldn't you take that job? But when the call came... You can imagine the stress levels rising. <laughs> the king has had a bad dream, and we're going to have to interpret it. And so they come in, and like this, O oh, king, live forever. They were very polite. And they had a very reasonable request, verse 4. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. So give us the details. Give us a little time. We'll go to the library. We'll look up a few scrolls. And hey, press, we'll be back in no time, and we'll be able to tell you what it means. But, verse 5 and 6, the king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces. It was pretty brutal, wasn't it? And your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, 
you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Now, to interpret the dream with the help of the scrolls was, was one thing, but to actually read somebody's mind and then interpret the dream was something altogether different. And Nebuchadnezzar uses both bribery and brutality. There's going to be a big reward if you're successful, and there's going to be big punishment if you're not. Now, normally, Nebuchadnezzar gets his way, but not this time. He's looking for wisdom, but he's looking for wisdom in the wrong places. Alistair Begg, you know I'm, I'm kind of keen on him. He, he refers to Nebuchadnezzar like Humpty Dumpty because Nebuchadnezzar, in a sense, had fallen off his wall and all the king's horses and all the king's men and all the king's astrologers and all the king's sorcerers and all the king's magicians couldn't put him back together again. And Nebuchadnezzar is broken. And so is Babylon, by the way. So the answer to his and to their needs actually is not in Babylon. You see, they're looking for wisdom in all the wrong places. Maybe, and some people say, well, why did he not tell them what the, the, um, the dream was? Perhaps Nebuchadnezzar's reluctance about giving the details of the dream was because he was fed up with their hogwash, he was fed up with their nonsense, he was fed up with their baloney, and he was really saying, you know, okay, if you're really into this stuff, tell me what the dream is, and then tell me what it means. I say again, we've got to refer this back to our Babylon. Our Babylon is full of bored, unsatisfied, hurting, broken people. And the answer to the needs of our Babylon is not in our Babylon, and it's not of our Babylon. It simply can't be. Because Babylon is the problem. So how can Babylon be the answer? See, the answer has to be from somewhere or someone else. Our land is spiritually sick. Our society is truth-starved and full of ignorance and nonsense. And sadly, the church is often confused. We are in Babylon. But the answer, the answer cannot be in or from Babylon because Babylon is the problem. Do you see that? I think it's important that you see that. Babylon is the problem, therefore Babylon can't be the answer. Well, in verses 10 and 11, we obviously can't look at every single verse. The astrologers answered the king, There's not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. Again, they ask for the details. And in verse 12, we have an explosion of anger. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. A full-scale slaughter was Ordered. This is the kind of person Nebuchadnezzar was. And of course, there are many regimes in our land that will try and kill, imprison, or silence the preaching of God and the preaching of the gospel. But that's another issue. Verse 13, you can see that Daniel and his mates were actually not present. So a warrant was was issued for their arrest and obviously for their execution. So again, don't we see here Nebuchadnezzar, picture of a world, fearful, weak, troubled, angry, hostile, vengeful. Of course, he, like all of us, needed a dose of reality. (laughs) He, like us, needs to know the one who is truly in control We need the wisdom of God and we need the word of God. So what are we seeing here? The need for wisdom in our Babylon. And we see, secondly, the wrong answer. The wisdom of Babylon. 
That's the wrong answer because Babylon can't fix Babylon. But that leads us to the right answer. And this is a long section. And we'll not have time to look at each and every verse, but we need to get the, the, the flow of it, the feel of it. And basically, the right answer is the wisdom that comes alone from God. Now, we can get advice about all kinds of things. You know, our careers, uh, even um, our economic advice, or financial advice, or legal advice. We can get all kinds of advice. That's okay. That's, there's not a problem with that. But wisdom alone comes from God. And how do we get it? Well, James tells us, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. James 1 verse 5. And what we see here is God give wisdom to Daniel, and then Daniel give God's wisdom to Nebuchadnezzar. But I think the way we want to approach these verses, 14 to 45, is think about what does a wise man or wise woman look like? What does a wise person do? Because if we want to be wise in our Babylon, then we need to learn from the scriptures that are here for us. And I think we have a few steps here that we can, we can follow. First of all, we need to be calm and faithful or faithfully calm. Verses 14 to 16. Or verse 15, he asked the, the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Sorry, I do need to read, read verse 14. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with, notice, wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Ariok then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Tact, or wisdom and tact, or like the ESV says, prudence and discretion. There's no panic here. See, wise people, trusting in the wisdom of God, we don't panic. We're calm in turmoil. It's not like a private Fraser in Dad's army. Do you know what we used to always say? Those of us of a certain age will remember. We're all doomed, you know? He said it with a Scottish accent. I can't do the Scottish accent. We're all doomed. Or, you know, that's the one side so pessimistic and negative. But the other, the other is, you know, que sera, sera. You know, whatever will be, will be. These aren't the approaches of somebody who's faithfully calm, seeking the wisdom of God. He took the initiative. He goes and he speaks to the person who is needing the help. He's confident in the wisdom of God, our Daniel friend, and he's confident in the leading of his Holy Spirit. And so he makes an appointment with the king. He doesn't just sit there and wait. He's up and doing. He also, of course, maintains fellowship, verse 17. This is very important. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He goes to wise friends, not fools. He goes to his partners in mission. Do you remember last week we were talking about the four musketeers? Well, he, he goes to the, the other three. They get together, soulmates, encouragers. Of course, it's very important. We mentioned at the end last week that very, very, very rarely does God call his people to solo faith. He calls us to community. He calls us into his body to be united and to be committed. And that's why we have worship services. Yeah, I, I think you hit our restrictions as much as I do where we can't talk to each other or hug each other or encourage each other. We have to come in quietly and sit down and leave, but hopefully one day soon we'll be able to be back doing what God expects us to do. But we have worship services, and we've got growth groups, and we've got youth work teams and children's ministry teams. We've got things like Tuesday Club and WASPs, and we've got prayer meetings, and lots and lots of opportunity for us to do community, because that's what wise people do, you see. Wise people will always be drawn to wise people so that they might learn and share and be blessed and be a blessing. So here's the question. Do you have wise, close friends? Or are your friends foolish and they drag you down? Uh, 
I remember once somebody once saying a long time ago to me, you can tell a lot about a person by their friends. You can tell a lot about a person by their friends. Listen, take the time. Make the effort. It's a sign of wisdom. Maintaining fellowship and then committed prayer, verses 18 and 19. He urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. He doesn't call a committee meeting, you'll notice, but a prayer meeting. A prayer meeting. See, for a crisis, or even for normal living, wise people pray. Wise people pray. Fools. Fools think they can do it by themselves. Fools think they don't need prayer or don't need to meet with the God we pray to. Wise people pray. Oh, there's a, there's a lot of things we can do in a crisis or even in normal times. It's very easy to rely on our wit, on our IQ. After all, Daniel and his mates, we were told in chapter 1, were 10 times wiser than the court officials. I, you know, Daniel and his boys could have got together, the four musketeers, and they could have said, you know, come on, lads, we can work this out. We can sort out this mess. We can fix this. We're 10 times wiser than everybody else. No. Prayer is what wise people do. Or, you see, we can try and pull a few political favors, you know, pull a few strings you know, of government. I mean, they're in the know. They've got connections. I mean, Ashpenaz, you know, the, the, the king's chief officer, he, he is somebody they know very well. I mean, you know, let's um, scratch a few backs. Let's call in a few favors. Let's have lunch and sort it out. We could even, maybe even bribe them. No. Prayer is what wise people do. Or, of course, we can just do what many people do. We weep and moan and gurn and complain and worry and have a pity party. No. Prayer is what wise people do. Again, can I quote Alistair Begg? We can do more than pray after we have prayed, but not before we have prayed. Can I invite you to come to the prayer meeting on Wednesday night? Can I say to you, my brothers and sisters, if you're too busy, then you're too busy. This is about total dependence on the Lord, where God's people gather to seek the face of God in the midst of chaos and confusion. And this prolonged prayer right into the night, as verse 19 implies. Our privilege is this. It's to talk to the sovereign of the universe who loves us and cares for us and hears us and intervenes for us. Pray. That's what wise people do. And of course, it's God-centered worship in verses 20 to 23. We read those verses at the beginning of the service. Wise people always worship, no matter what. They have a, a song in their heart and words of praise on their lips, and they just love to tell God what they think of him. And we've done that tonight. We have one more song before we go home this evening. And of course, we know that God provided the answer. And that's what led to the song of praise in verses 20 to 23. He always gives an answer, you know. Do do you know that? He always gives an answer. Sometimes we maybe don't like it, or sometimes we don't see it or understand it, but he gives an answer. Can I say to you, every single problem in the world today, and I mean every single problem has got a spiritual answer. That's how confident we are in our God. Wise people see this and understand this. Fools will try every single other answer that won't give an answer. And as we look at our society descending into paganism and decadent living, 
our leaders are hopeless and helpless and helpless in trying to sort it out. Would you want to be the first minister of our country? Dear, help that person. I will pray for that person, but I wouldn't want to be that person because they've got an almost impossible job because our country does not want the answer that God wants to give to us. Wise people seek his wisdom, and fools seek the wisdom of Babylon. So seek him in prayer, plead for his mercy and help and ask for his wisdom. It's a hard thing to do, but it's necessary. We also see a holy boldness proclamation. We could, um, that's a third P if you think of um, um, and, and, and prayer and, and passion. And, and here we see proclamation. It's, it's um, a long section, 24 to 30 at least, or four, in fact, 2 to 45, I think I put up there. But it's really summarized there in verses 27 and 28. Perhaps we could read those verses. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who can reveal mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. And he goes on to say what... What they are. So now it's basically saying, Nebuchadnezzar, um, pagan religion and, and your clergy are no answer. Babylon has got no answer to this. None of your experts can do what you want, but there is a God who will reveal it to you and for you. Verse 28. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And verse 30 he says, It's not I, but it's him. It's very clear who's getting the glory. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I am greater wisdom than any other living man, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. He says, I, 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 I'm just a messenger. I'm just a messenger. I don't dream it up. I, I get it from him and I give it to you. We need to be in prayer for our land, you know? And we need to be in prayer for our rulers. Instead of criticizing them, and maybe even feeling sorry for them, as I have indicated that I do feel sorry for them, we've got to pray for them. Do you know what we should be praying for? Maybe we'll do this on Wednesday night, that that God will unsettle them. will unsettle Boris. That God will cause them sleeplessness. And that God will provide them with a Daniel who will present to them the wisdom of God. Now, I don't know if you listened to something that Boris said recently around Easter. Somebody showed me a clip of it. It was actually very promising what he said about the church and about the Christian faith. We need somebody to tell him the gospel. We're to proclaim truth. And therefore, we need to get close to these people to share the truth with them. Daniel explains the dream. It's about a giant statue. It looks rather weird, doesn't it? A mixture of gold and silver and bronze and iron and clay. And then there's this rock that destroys the statue and grows into a mountain. It's a bit weird, isn't it? But what's it all about? Well, let me tell you what it's all about. It's all about the sovereignty of God and his kingdom. A rock that will fill the whole earth. Church of Jesus Christ and his gospel message. It's also about a theology of history. You see, history is is not just a series of random events. History is not just the plans of kings and emperors and governments and presidents. History, are you listening? History is the stage on which the God of heaven works out his plans for the good of his people and the glory of his name. And we're told there in verse 38 that Nebuchadnezzar and his empire, they're the gold. Other kingdoms will rise and fall, but the kingdom of God, the rock, the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, will eventually become the greatest power and influence in in history. Now, just for your information, there's all kinds of theories about uh, who these are, what, what empires these other uh, parts of, of the statue reflect. and The silver pr- possibly re- reflects the Persian Empire, bronze, the Greek Empire, and the iron and clay, the Roman Empire. And they came in history down from the time of Daniel to actually the time of Christ. 
But I don't think we need to limit that. I think the point is we're not supposed to limit them just to ancient empires, but to more modern empires, like the Napoleonic Empire or the British Empire. I mean, it's come and gone, and there's a distant memory kept together by the Commonwealth idea. And then we have got the German Third Reich that lasted for, what, 10 years or so? The Soviet Union Empire, again, history, the American Empire, which some, with, with a friend, recently he said, you know, America's finished. It's dying. And, and, and then we've got the rise of China. Do you think China's going to rule the world forever and ever? No. <laughs> they will all come and they will all go, as ordained by God. History is the stage on which he reveals his glory and sees his people, the church, the rock, grow and grow and grow. And there are more Christians today in the world than ever before. And the church will grow. Because God is sovereign and history is under his control. So the focus is not on empires which are impressive and powerful for a while. The focus is actually on the rock, verse 44. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will be left to other people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. And of course, the rock is Jesus and his kingdom. Do you remember Jesus, the stone the builders rejected but became the capstone? Jesus, his body, the church, is the rock. God is sovereign and God is working out his plans and his purpose. Kingdoms will rise and kingdoms will fall, but his kingdom is indestructible and all victorious and everlasting. Do you think Northern Ireland is going to live and last forever? Does it need to last forever? Is it that important? What about the United Kingdom? Is it more important than the kingdom of God? More important than the rock? And the beginnings of the rock so humbled. Do you remember? It all began... From our perspective, in a sense, it began back in time, uh, before time began, but it was a Jewish carpenter dying on the cross. That's where it began. A Jewish carpenter butchered by one of those very empires that Daniel was explaining to Nebuchadnezzar. The Romans tried, actually, to destroy the church. I'm sure you know about that, the persecution of the early church. And the church had no army, no land, <laughs> No government, no human leader, and it outlived the Roman Empire, and it continues to outlive every other empire. Why? Because God is sovereign and is in control of history. And today, you know, there are many within the Islamic world seeking to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. They will feel. And we have... Today, in our own Babylon, powers that are trying to seduce us, deceive us, shut us up, and destroy us, they will fail. Today, all the enemies of the church of Jesus Christ must know that every single one of them will bow before the throne of King Jesus. We will all bow before Jesus one day. So let us be wise and not be foolish. And I say to you this, please, please, do not sacrifice your souls. Do not sacrifice your eternity. Moms and dads, do not sacrifice your family's spiritual health for the sake of Babylon. Do not sacrifice your soul, your eternity, your family for the rewards of the world. Because Babylon 
cannot save you, satisfy you, and keep you. Babylon will fail you. See, it's all really about the rock, the rock that is Jesus, salvation by him, with him, and for him. Daniel saw it. I hope we do. Let me very quickly deal. Oh, I forgot about that. Let me deal quickly with the fruit. Um, verses 46 to 40, just a second or two. See, when we walk in wisdom, we can expect God's blessing. And Daniel, we see here, is rewarded with privileges and positions of power. Verse 48. Then the king placed Daniel in high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him rule over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all the wise men. And there's three um, friends also got positions of power in Babylon. Verse 49. You see, Nebuchadnezzar is impressed with wisdom and the, the source of this wisdom. He begins to see, of course. Um, verse 47. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. There's always going to be blessing when we're wise. I think sometimes we get confused. We act foolishly, and yet we still expect to get blessing from God. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. He's not going to reward foolishness, but he will reward wisdom. Praise be to his name. But the king... We also see the fruit, bad fruit from him. You know, what does he do? He, he, he seems to get all religious here, doesn't he? Verse 47, we already read there. He gets a kind of wee bit of religion, you know? That's the best, of course, the world can supply. And in fact, the world's quite happy if we just be slightly religious. It really doesn't, they don't really mind if we come here and sing and pray, as long as we don't rock the boat, and as long as we don't criticize them. Very happy for us to keep doing that. So we have been religions okay as far as the world concerned, but when we follow Jesus the rock, they don't like that. They will reject us. But Nebuchadnezzar gets slightly religious, but next time we're going to see that soon he gets back to his old bad ways. He had a religious experience, no doubt, but still he was unsaved and untouched in his soul. Herod was a wee bit like that. Do you remember he liked John the Baptist? Do you remember he, he liked hearing John the Baptist preach? And he actually he seemed to like him as a man. But eventually, he had John the Baptist's head put on a plate. You see, a wee bit of religion's no good. Can I say to you, my friends, beware of preaching that only stirs you emotionally. Beware of preaching that creates vague interest in religion, beware of preaching that just touches us superficially. You should expect me, you should be telling me, give it to me, give it to us, unsettle us, challenge us, make us think, lead us to the rock. See, we can be good, we can be interested, we can be conservative, we can be moral, we can be religious, and we can still be unconverted. And that's a tragic waste of a soul. I wonder if there's anybody in here tonight, and you're good, and you're interested, and you're conservative, and you're moral, and you're religious, and you are unconverted. Tragic waste. Beware of the I'll be ever so religious trap. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be like Daniel. I'm going to be religious. I'm going to pray a wee bit more. I'm going to... No, we go to the rock. And we're saved by the rock. Forever and forever. We need the rock. We need Jesus. Because you know the wise man or the wise woman builds his life upon the rock. Christ Jesus the foolish man, the foolish woman, builds his life upon the sands of Babylon. So tonight, are you building your life upon the sand of Babylon, the sand of the world, or are you building your life upon the rock, Christ Jesus? In exile, be wise in him. 
And I suppose if you have three takeaways, um, I've run out of time. Prayer, praise, proclamation. Isn't that the way of the wise? Let's give ourselves to prayer, to praise, to proclamation. That's the way to live a wise life.